Not a very, very good evening, everybody. And on behalf of Pick and Pay, the Pick and Pay Wine Club, Pick and Pay Online, and Warwick Wine Estate, a very, very warm welcome to our latest virtual winemakers table. Uh, my name's Dan Nicholl, the host of Dan Really Likes Wine. You can probably, from Dan Really Likes Wine, work out what one of my chief interests is. If you haven't seen it before, Dan Really Likes Wine, is my online wine show, which really is just an excuse to every week taste out and try some fantastic South African wine. And I've been lucky enough to drink wine all over the world. And very simply, there is no country in the world where both the quality and the price of wine combine quite as well as they do here in South Africa. And every time we have one of our winemakers tables, we are reminded of that, as I'm reminded every time I walk through Pick and Pay and see what is on offer and see the wine that I'm able to bring home with me. And it is exactly that kind of wine that we celebrate today. Uh, today we get to hang out with a winemaker and a wine estate that I've got a very soft spot for. Uh, and it's for a, a number of reasons. One of them is that the day after I got married, I had a picnic with family and friends after the wedding at Warwick Wine Estate. Uh, it was a very celebratory affair. It was the day after uh, my dear mother broke her ankle, falling off a table dancing, which she's made me promise never to tell anybody in public. So you didn't hear that from me. Let's just keep it between ourselves if we can. Uh, it's also a spot that has the most wonderful picnics. It's got a lovely little dam. It is a beautiful escape over the course of the weekend to go and visit it. But it's also home to some terrific wine and a terrific legacy of making wine. You will see on two of your three bottles uh, which were delivered to you. Here is your rosé boy of example. You will see the first lady and the first lady refers to a woman called Norma Ratcliffe. And Norma Ratcliffe was a trailblazer in South African wine. She was one of our first female winemakers. She was the first woman ever to be a member of the Cape Winemakers Guild and if you look at the number of top women winemakers in South Africa at the moment, and we've got a huge number of them, almost all of them will pay tribute to the inspiration and example of Norma Ratcliffe many years ago. Norma's still going strong. She was on my wine show a few months ago. Uh, the legacy that she's left is now being uh, shown through, not just by great winemakers across the Cape, but in particular by a young man called JD. And you're gonna meet him in just a moment. He's another reason I love Warwick because he has taken over uh, at, uh, at Warwick. I knew him from his days at Stiernberg uh, down in the Constantia Valley. Uh, he is now in Stellenbosch. He's been there for a few years now. Uh, he had some big shoes of Nick Van Aard to fill and he's more than comfortably filled them. And what you'll discover this evening is not just some great wine, but also a winemaker who's taking three very different categories, a Sauvignon Blanc, a Rosé, a Pinotage, and delivering each of them with a trademark style that celebrates the terror celebrates uh, the uh, the area in which this wine comes from and delivers something quite special. JD will give you a bit more detail on all of these wines. He'll also, I presume, tell you who uh, Professor Black was. Sounds a bit like a character from Cluedo. He's nasty, he's something else entirely, and you'll get that, as well as the story behind these three different wines. And you'll also get from Jonathan, our resident chef, three dishes that bring out the very best of this particular food. Uh, but what I'll ask you to do during the course of the evening is to keep some of your dishes. Once you've made the first one, keep it and try it with the other wine as well, because experimenting with wine and seeing how different wine and different food come together really is one of the joys of this particular space. And it's one I suspect that you'll all enjoy because you're all here for a food and wine evening from all over South Africa. And we're in Enormously grateful for that. Joining us, particularly our members of the Pick and Pay Wine Club, uh, who get such great benefits, such as joining us on evenings like this. Uh, and a big thank you to the Wine Club and to Pick and Pay Online, as well as to Warwick for making this evening happy. Uh, happen. Man, happy as well, but happen. Uh, a couple of requests. If you haven't already, please open your wine. Uh, just let it breathe. If you haven't already, get a little bit of, uh, of air to it. If your Sauvignon Blanc and Rosé haven't been in the fridge, pop them in now. But 
If your Sauvignon Blanc has been in the fridge all afternoon, now's a good time to take it out because you don't want your Sauvignon Blanc too cold. You don't want your rosé too cold. It tends to close up the wine a little bit and you maybe don't get quite as much out of it as ideally you would. So Sauvignon Blanc, pretty cool. The, uh, the rosé just a little warmer uh, and, uh, and go from there. I'm going to see you at the end of the evening or amongst other things, I will hand out 200 rand in smart shopper points to five of you and it's very easy to win those uh, just take some photos through the course of the evening post them online and two tags you need one is hashtag warwick and the other is hashtag pnp wine club so if you can post those uh, i'll choose five winners at the end of our meal together and our wine together i'll also ask you to please keep your camera on uh, both so we can phone the fire brigade if you manage to set fire to your salads uh, but more importantly so there's a, a real sense of community as we're together and we can get an understanding who else is out there what we're doing and how we're enjoying things uh, and finally before i disappear for now you'll see down at the bottom uh, there is a chat button you jump on that if you have a question, something you didn't understand, something you'd like to know more about, please fire away. Send in those questions or those comments. Tell us you love the wine or you thought the food pairing was surprisingly good. We'd love to hear you and it makes the evening so much more interactive. As I say, I'm going to be back with you. I'm going to move over to my food now and get my wine poured. And I leave you in the hands of not just JD, who is one of my favorite winemakers and a very, very accomplished man in the cellar, uh, but also Jonathan, who is an outstanding chef. He's won more Awards and I can count and together they'll take you through the rest of the evening. I'll see you a little later. Don't forget to post online with those hashtags. Happy drinking, happy eating and I'll see you later. Over to JD and to Jonathan. Enjoy. All right. Thank you very much, Dan. That was a lovely introduction. Um, and welcome, everybody, to the Pick and Pay Winemakers Table. And today we are very, very excited because we are back in the studio with Warwick Wine for the second time in one year. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty much exactly a year ago that we, we did the first Warwick Wine. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Dan. Yes, exactly. We were checking now. It's almost exactly a year to the day. Last May. And it's very, very exciting. We've got some new wines this time to try, which is also very exciting. Exactly. New food to taste. Yeah, exactly. So you guys are going to have an incredible experience. Um, thank you very much to Pick and Pay Online for delivering your boxes. Um, this time that they're actually in these really, really nice reusable cooler bags this yeah, time, that's very cool. which is very good, which you can reuse. Um, and so inside those boxes, obviously you will find three little boxes with all of the canapé ingredients uh, which we are going to make and I'm going to teach you how to do all of that as well as obviously what we're going to the main part of the evening is we're really going to try three of these most beautiful wines and as Dan said it's very exciting because they all are so different we've got a rosé we've got a Sauvignon Blanc and we've got a Pinotage as well so enough of me obviously what I want you guys to do while um, we just sort of introduce ourselves is to unpack your boxes make sure that you've got all your ingredients right if you do have a friend or a family member in the kitchen get them to sort out all of your kitchen, get your chopping board ready, your knives, your scissors, all of those little bits and pieces that you're gonna to need to make three incredible canapes. And while you're doing that, um, let's find out a little bit more about JD yourself and a little bit more about Warwick Wine. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Great to, great to be here, great to be back and, uh, and share Warwick wines, share food. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so Warwick is based in, in Stellenbosch. Mm -hmm. We're on the, the Northern side, so towards Pol. Okay. And uh, we're, so effectively, the furthest away from the ocean as you could go in, in Stellenbosch. That means we're a slightly warmer climate. Yes. Um, obviously, the closer you are to the ocean, uh, the more influence that has. And, and for that reason, we are predominantly a red wine estate. Sure. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't make white wines. We just make them in a, in a different style and a different way. But I think for most people, they think of Warwick, they think of the first lady Cabernet Sauvignon, they think of Cabernet Franc, they think of Trilogy, etc. Um, but we're going to taste a few other wines tonight, which is always great fun to share. And also, like you said, different um, styles of, of yeah. in essence, the same grape. And yeah, myself, I've been there now for just over um, three years. Um, I completed my, my third harvest there. So starting to become yeah. accustomed to everything. Obviously, we had a big COVID uh, chunk in the middle, Absolutely. which we've all been through, which has kind of thrown a curveball in, in all of our lives. 
Um, but that was actually a great time for us as a team. Um, we really streamlined a lot of things. We got to, to do a lot of stock take and, and, yeah. um, and really figure out what we want to do. And also created things like this. Eh? I mean, last year, it was yeah. the first time you did one. Exactly. It was, it was the number first, one. Yeah. First event, first virtual event. And here we are a year later. Still, still people joining in, still people sharing it. So, so yes, it was, a, it was a very challenging time for lots of reasons. But there were also cool mm. little snippets of, of really fun things that came out of it. Completely. And um, yeah, it's great to, to be back. And it's great to share our wines and, and um, yeah, talk, talk food and wine. Amazing. Yeah, we're going to have a excellent evening we've got three wines obviously um what we want to do is we want to kind of move through them in a in a in a way is it any when we're talking about wine pairings and food pairings is it better to kind of start off with a red or a white or a rosé or what's the kind of the the order which you normally do these things in? to me the great thing about food and wine is that in essence there are no rules there are a lot of guidelines and they're yeah. kind of things that work better than others sure but there is really no right or wrong so if yeah. you want to start as a first course with a big cabernet and a steak yeah. and the second course a very light vegetarian dish that's that's your choice as long yeah. as you make sure that those two wines or the wines and the food matches um you can do whatever you please yeah. but generally speaking they kind of do follow a, a kind of they curve up and yes. then taper down again but i suppose that's a very kind of classical french um menu Absolutely. design yeah. um but there isn't really a, a, yeah. a right or wrong that's that to me is the cool thing about it and and also the nice thing about i think where chefs and wine makes are very mm. similar we'll give two chefs the same ingredients but they'll make different food absolutely they've yeah. got their own ideas they've got their own um, flavors they've got their own way of expressing and the same thing for for wines if you give two people the same block of grapes and yeah. go make wine those wines will ultimately won't taste the same exactly and um that to me is is very interesting so the the french terroir the word mm. terroir is kind of the so the soil the climate everything else but there's there's a winemaker there's a person included in the kind of natural Completely. elements of it um and even though we try and kind of keep a consistent style and a house yeah. style I mean, we work with a natural product. Of uh, course. We were chatting about the, the harvest earlier. Mm -hmm. This year, we had a huge amount of heat waves. Last yeah. year, we didn't. You have rain during the season. So all of those things affect the, the grape. And that's our only ingredient that we work Completely. with. We don't add anything else. So, so every year is different. And that, to me, is the, the great thing about wine. Is Completely. You can, you can never really understand it. Because yeah. as soon as you think, okay, I understand uh, Pinotage then there would be an, a vintage that you haven't tasted uh, that you haven't tried yeah. and yes you might get a, a better understanding and a feeling for it yeah but you'll never really understand it it's a subject that always changes and and wines change as they age it's a living thing in the bottle yeah. in five years time that wine's going to taste different yeah completely and that's also very interesting about that is how you know obviously each year with the climate change and with weather that is you can't have exactly the same wine it's quite hard to, it's quite Sometimes it's important for you guys to try and, you know, try and get the similar kind of flavors, but also they are always going to change. Exactly. Which so is we'll, very, have a, very we'll have a house style that we yeah. try and stick to um, uh, for things like the rosé, specifically yes. color is a big thing. Yeah. So we always make a very light one and that's something we can control. Mm. You don't want to go to a very pink one next year and then exactly. go back. And so, so, so we control what we can. But ultimately, there's there's variables that we yeah. can't control, and um, but and that's that, the exciting. Part. That's the exciting part. So Completely. you can do this every year for the next twenty years. No one will be the same because the yeah. wines won't be the same, and therefore the food won't be the same. Exactly, exactly, and that's why we change it, and that's why we experiment, and that's really why we are here today because we want to sort of give our knowledge and to share with you that there really aren't many many rules, and it's all about experimenting. It's all about trying new things. But I'm going to teach you something today, and JD's going to talk a little bit more about the wine, and we're going to explain a little bit how about these flavors work. All right, so I think it's time that we get into the kitchen, and we start talking a little bit about our first canapé, before, and the reason why we have... Let's just make sure everybody's got wine. So exactly. Pour, so pour, pour a glass wine. of rosé. I'm going to pour you just a little bit more of that. Amazing. All right. So and, then obviously, um, yeah, the first wine that we are going to be doing is obviously the the Warwick First Lady Rosé. And I'll speak to you a little bit more about the detail, Perfect. but just make sure everybody's got a, a glass full to go. Exactly. All right, amazing. So we decided to pair this one with a goat cheese tartlet. It's got some preserved fig. It's got a little bit of cured copper ribbons, and it's got a little bit of candied walnuts. And this really is just a kind of a building of different flavors, a little bit of crunch, a little bit of saltiness, a little bit of creaminess. Um, and we'll find out as we go along how well this pairs specifically with the rosé 
Right, so in your boxes, as I explained, please take out, we've got a little tar case, very, very, very simple. This is just a little bit of short crust pastry that we put into a tar case and we baked it. You can find these also in your pick and pay. We also have got some copper ham, which you can take out of your packet and get ready to cut that up. We've got a little bit of preserved fig, really sort of, you've got a little bit of sweetness. It's also got a lot of sort of fruity aromas. Um, and then obviously a little bit of the goat cheese, which you'll find in a piping bag over here and some candied walnuts. So take them all out of the packet um, and place your little tar case onto your board. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna start building this up. So as we do that, I want you guys just to cut a little bit of the end of your feta, I mean, your, your goat cheese um, little uh, bag over there. And we're gonna pipe that into the tart case. But before we do that, let's have a little smell <laughs> of, a, of the, the rosé. Yeah, so 100% uh, pinotage yes. rosé, so which is, I think, quite interesting, especially as we're tasting the pinotage um, at the end. Very interesting. So very, very different wines that you can yeah. make from the same grape variety. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the color is for us very important. Yes. So we want this lovely light salmon pink color. Yeah. Uh, the wine's low in alcohol, 11.5%, and it's, it's bone dry. It's got no sugar. Ah. So those are our key elements, yes. and those, again, are things that we'll stick to and stylistically sure. keep, um, keep consistent year, year after year. And it's, it's got an incredible um, flavor spectrum. There's a lot of uh, almost uh, strawberries, a bit yes. of strawberry and cream, but there's a fruit element as well mm -hmm. uh, that I find really um, crazy you've got like almost peaches and and uh, apricot stone fruits in yeah. there and then there's a, a little bit of a kind of mineral um, element to it as well yes. so i think a, a really cool match because we will pick up a little bit of the acidity um, that you've got in it, a little bit of sweetness and salt and all of the ingredients i think all of those you'll pick up in the wine yeah and it'll be very cool to see how they then end up and and then work together exactly I love the color and I think that this is also one of the things that, you know, I think that rosés have moved away from, I think in the early days there was, it was very sort of a bright pink color. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that it's kind of followed and maybe a little bit of a trend of sort of the South of France, those exactly. sort of rosés, exactly. which are and a I, bit I think more salmon. Um, rosé used to be made as a, as a byproduct of red wine. Mm. So obviously rosé is made from red grapes. And um, people would, would make red wine, but they would draw off some of the, oh, the juice kind of early yes. on in the, in the stage of that winemaking. And those wines always were quite dark. They were quite yes. um, rich in aromatics because you can imagine mm. you're picking them for a, for a bold, robust red wine. Exactly. Whereas in this case, this is a dedicated rosé. We sure. pick the wines, the grapes very early and we use only four hours of skin contact. So okay. very, very very light, light and, wow. and not a red wine wine making sure at all so and that gives us this lovely um red yeah, color but that also because we pick the the wine um oh, sorry the grapes so early it gives the wine this incredible fruit aromatics and that's yeah. also what pinotage does really well is it adds um because it, it actually ripens very early in the season pinotage is uh, along with pinot noir the two red varieties that ripen the earliest on okay so it's a bit of a nightmare from a seller point of view because sure. you're just in your sauvignon blanc mindset yeah. this is what we're doing because the varieties tend to ripen quite nicely in a sure in a in a sequence and pinotage is completely out of sequence so that comes in very early in the season but because it comes in early you actually have quite a lot of ri uh, ripeness at that yes. um, low sugar levels because it ripens early so quickly yeah so you've got you've got a lot of aromatics you've got you've got good acidity yeah um so it really is a is a i think a variety that lends itself to um, to rosé to rosé and yeah. specifically like you said to those mm. provencal wines from the south of france mm. and in this lighter color it's absolutely um, it's got delicious. great texture it's got great richness and yeah should very interested to see how Perfect. it works with your pairing yeah so take a sip if you want to just sort of understand the wine a little bit and while we are obviously these wines are supposed to be enjoyed as well on their own exactly. so take a little sip while we are in the kitchen yeah. and i hope everybody has got their tart cases on their board and ready to start compiling this dish all of our elements so what we're going to do is we're going to start off by using our whipped goat cheese very simple, this goat cheese, all it is, it's whipped up um, with a little bit of um, a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper, um, and it's a little bit of cream just to kind of loosen it up. You can use some milk if you want to. 
Um, but there we are. We're just going to put a few little dots in and amongst the, the tar case. If you want to do a swirl, feel free to do a swirl. If you want to do a big dollop in the middle, it's absolutely fine too. All right, then what we're going to take is our copper ham. Copper ham is obviously um, ham that is being cured. It's generally um, like an Italian style cured ham. It's got a little bit of fat in it, which is quite nice also, because we want to kind of get that fattiness and the acidity of the um, rosé is going to cut through that fat quite nicely. So similarly, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to slice this into a few little strips. So we've got a few little strips like that. Uh, there we go. Show it to you on the board. One or two little strips. And what we're going to do is we're going to roll these into little ribbons um, on top of our, there we go, on top of our tar case. So a few little strips, simple as that. If you want to throw one in your mouth, you certainly can do. But what I'll do is I'm just going to roll these up into little, into little ribbon balls. I'm going to place that into our tart. So when you're cooking and when you're creating dishes, it's always important to kind of think about different flavors and different textures and sort of contrast as well. So I love to have something that maybe is a little bit salty um, and add something that's a little bit sweet, something that's got a crunch, something that's got a quite smooth and creamy as well. So this little canapé is kind of putting all of those elements together. And I think that that will work quite nicely. As you said, there's quite a fair amount yeah. of minerality in the in the And also well. quite a nice richness that will, mm. will match the, the fattiness um, yeah. in there. And also then you've got other, other elements that bring the, bring the acidity. So exactly. It's be very cool. All right. Then what we're going to do is we're going to move on to our fig. So this is a green fig um, that's just been preserved in a little bit of sugar syrup. These are all obviously available inside Pick and Pay. And what we'll do is we'll just slice that and we'll place that around the tart case as well inside. One or two or three. There is, seems to be quite enough to go around. So if you want to make another one, that's certain you can do. And then just to finish off this, we've got a few candied walnuts. Very, very simple. All these are, are walnuts that you put, um, you cook a little bit of sugar into a sugar syrup, which is basically sugar, a little bit of water, and you cook that down into a syrup and you dunk them into that and then you dry them out in the oven. Simple, you can probably mm. buy them as well, but it's much nicer to make <laughs> them yourself. And that we're just going to crumble on the top, one or two or three. And there we have your first canapé. This is a tart case filled with a little bit of goat cheese mousse, a little bit of pit fig, a little bit of the um, copper ham, and some candied walnuts. All right. So I'm not going to be the one tasting this. JD, Brilliant. this is up to you. And awesome. what I want you guys at home to do as well is please don't forget to take pictures of your creations. We'd love to see what you are, are doing. And as Dan mentioned also, that there will be five lucky winners who will win 200 Rand in Smart Shopper points at the end of the evening. So take pics and use the hashtag PMP Wine Club as well as hashtag Warwick Wines. Don't forget. All right. Keep your cameras on as well. We can see you and we'd love to see what you guys are doing at home. So pour yourself a little bit more if you'd yeah, like. Please. Shall we, shall we cut, cut it we in half? Then we can, cut it in half. I don't want to destroy your <laughs> thing, but we're going to eat it. There we go. Place. Cut it in um, half. There we go. Half for you. Thank you. All right. So yeah. when we're talking about pairings, it's nice to kind of take a good sip of the wine. Let the flavor go throughout your mouth. Take a nice big bite of the canapé. Let the kind of the flavors mix a little bit and then just see if what works and what doesn't exactly. work. Yeah, that's that's the whole point of it is to try and experience and see and try it again. And once uh, immediately, once you've had something fatty in your mouth, um, your perception of acidity, etc., yeah. else everything else will change. And um, and so it goes on. So as as you eat more, the, the flavors will continue to develop. So let's give it a go. This looks great. Thank you. So what I love about this is that you got that, that goat cheese, which is very creamy. Mm. And what I love about goat cheese and why it works so well with wines, especially wine with quite like a, a bit of acidity, mm. is it clears your mouth almost. You've got that richness and creaminess in your mouth and you have the sort of acidity of this beautiful wine and it kind of cleans it and makes it, kind of balances it out a bit. Exactly. And also acidity matches acidity. So mm. the more acidic, your wine is the more acid, acidic your food needs to be and generally people do it the other way they yes. think oh the wine is acidic 
my food needs to be sweet. Sure, sure, sure. And those end up clashing. So for things like rosé or Sauvignon Blanc that have got a bright acid, yes. use something like a goat cheese or tomatoes or something where, yes. where you actually find the, um, <clears throat> the, yeah, the, the weight exactly. the weight and the weight mm. and the acidity and the acidity. So if you've got yes. a really big buttery fat Chardonnay, yeah. make something creamy. Don't make a, a acidic light fresh yes. something because then exactly. those, those two end up fighting each other. So you've got to find the, the, the kind of elements that, that work together and then kind of boost those two yeah. in the food and the wine. I think you should be a chef as well. Well, I like cooking. I am <laughs> I'm not necessarily very good at it, but I enjoy it. I so think, we spend a lot of time yeah. in, the, in the kitchen at home. My wife's a very good cook. It's amazing because I think that obviously there's always a similarity between chefs and, and winemakers because it is quite a art to try and balance different flavors and try and, you know, when you're yeah. doing red blends and different blends, it's really about adding a little bit of this and adding a little bit of that and sort of balancing it out and thinking we might need to have this or that. Exactly. I, I think um, cooking is very similar to winemaking because mm -hmm. you've got, in essence, a lot of science that you need to understand. There's a lot of understanding your ingredients and then flavors and how they work together. Yes. Um, you've got, I think, a slightly easier task in the sense that you've got more yep. ingredients to play with. <laughs> That's for sure. But then um, ultimately you've <laughs> got to know how to use them and different for techniques. Sure. Whereas winemaking is simpler in the sense that it's, you only have one ingredient and you can, yes. I mean, there's one process. And exactly. yes, there are ways and means that you can tweak them. But in essence, it's kind of one concept that you need to understand. But, um, but yeah, I think there's a big similarity yeah. between food and wine. And I also think that's why they work so well together. Completely. And, um, and it is a creative process, ultimately. Mm. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, you know what it's like if you find a, a really good tomato. I mean, a tomato is a humble completely it's an ingredient a, but but if you get a great, great tomato one, yeah. and you have a tomato sandwich with a bit of salt and pepper it's unreal beautiful and it's the same with wine if you can, can taste that this is grown in a happy place this is a happy plant that's making that's happy exactly wine it. so yeah to not get too philosophical about it to get back to your um to your canopy uh, i love that little bit of um almost earthiness that the that the candied walnut brings yes. it's got a bit of sugar and what's nice is having these little components is depending on, on what you bite where, it yes. adds element, different elements into the wine. It's yeah, not exactly. one big mush of yeah. everything combined. You've got, got a bit of sugar, you've got a bit of salt, you've got a bit of acidity. And I think that's, um, that's, yeah. that's really cool about all of these little elements. Yeah, it's so all about done. building flavors. It really is. Amazing. So I hope you guys enjoyed that pairing. Um, I really did. Honestly, I think that um, for me, the Warwick Rosé is my ultimate, the ultimate um of the of the rosés and i cannot wait to taste the next one um i did have a little bit of a sneak um into it early on and i think that it's going to be absolutely incredible we're going to be making another canapé with our next wine um so uh, similar kind of thing yep thank you very much um what we're going to be doing the next wine um jd which is a very special wine and something slightly different which you can explain is the um professor black sauvignon blanc yes so as Dan mentioned earlier, he is not a Cluedo character. Um, the Professor Black was a real person. He's not a made-up character. He um, was a professor at the University of Stellenbosch. Um, oh, really? Yes. And he uh, specialized in um, pomology, soft fruits. Sure. And he developed or selected a early ripening peach variety. Uh, Warwick, and this is in the 60s, um, mm. Warwick had just started. Stan Ratcliffe and Norma Ratcliffe had yes. just um, uh, set up the business. At that point in time, it wasn't a winery. They had a lot of vineyards. Yes. But they had all sorts. It was a farm. And they had all sorts of fruits and vegetables. They had pumpkins. They had pigs. And then they had quite a big peach and plum orchard. And... Um, Having been quite close to the, to the um, town of Stellenbosch, yeah. the professor uh, approached um, Stan Ratcliffe and asked him if he could plant a commercial orchard on, on Warwick, okay. asking to just kind of see if we can do a big, um, a big experiment of this, yes. to see how it reacts in real life. We've done, we've done our kind of lab trials, et Completely, cetera, yeah. and planted a few trees, but we want to see if we plant an orchard of this, how does it work? Yes. And, um, the, that early ripening uh, peach variety and his idea was that it is going to go out into the world in a time where the northern hemispheres peaches are already done but yes. the rest of the southern hemispheres aren't yet on the market and yeah. it's going to give south africa this little gap this yeah. little wedge in, in into the uh, international market 
Unfortunately, what he'd done is by moving all of those ripening elements earlier, he, um, he moved the entire growing season earlier. Ah. So including the flowering of, of the fruit. So yes. the flowers ended up flowering straight in the windy season in October to November. You know what it's like. You live yeah. in Cape Town. You know the Southeaster. Yeah. And unfortunately just killed all of the, um, all of the flowers. So it just blew the flowers away. away not, not yeah. killed them. They just blew away. So unfortunately they, it commercially, it never got, it wasn't yes. successful because it never had um, bared enough fruit. Yeah. So economically it wasn't viable. So unfortunately that peach orchard and, and peaches take a long time to bear fruit. So mm. about 10, 12 years into this experiment, they figured yes. out that this is not working. That then, um, chopped out the, the orchard. And obviously by that time, they'd been working together for quite a while. Um, and Stan and the professor had become good friends. Yeah. So when he pulled out that orchard, he replanted it with grapes and he replanted it with Sauvignon Blanc. Yes. And he named that specific vineyard Professor Black. <laughs> and ever since then, yeah. Sauvignon Blanc kind of got known as Professor Black. And it got a personality more so than just a, just a, a vineyard. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's been part of Warwick stable for, for many years. And um, it's amazing to me, if you smell the wine, you can smell peaches in there. There's, there's a, is, there is an element of it. It is definitely there. peachy. There's a lot of fruit. Yeah, a there's huge a, amount of fruit. There's, there's a lot of tropical fruits in there. It really but smells a, great on the nose. Yeah, so, um, so we've got a, a question here about the, the quality of 22 harvest. Yeah, I mean, it was a late harvest, wasn't it? <laughs> well, it was and it wasn't. It was yeah. early and a late harvest. We so had all of these heat waves. Yes. So initially it started very late the season mm. i mean up until basically christmas we had a very cold summer yeah um you can remember it was it was actually chilly like yeah. all the way up until i think it was about Jan the 20th of december yeah. we had our first day mm. high 30s yeah. and then january hit and every single weekend we went to, i mean i stand paul it's a warm place to begin with yeah but we were hitting 45s weekend just we had five weeks of excessive heat waves in a row yes and then that completely changed the kind of swing of of the season yeah so it was a challenging season it wasn't a case where you could sit back and uh the grapes kind of because normally winemakers will say oh, i don't know the wine makes itself like, yes so you had to pay attention in this <laughs> class like yeah. otherwise you failed the yeah. test um so there was a lot of of stuff happening um i think we we managed very well in the end and um, it was a good yield, especially in the Stellenbosch region. We were about 25% up in volume Amazing. last year. And ultimately, everything that ended up in the, in the winery, far better than we initially expected. Because we were, with the late season, almost worrying that we weren't going to get the fruit right. Yes. And then that some of those heat waves obviously were a little bit too much. But most of them actually helped just to kind of kickstart the season again. Good. Well, I mean, I'm glad it was a good, a good yeah. harvest. Yeah. So, so to... I've kind of broadly about Stellenbosch, but this yeah. um, this specific wine I think is quite unique. Very unique. Um, in in the sense that it is from Stellenbosch. Mm -hmm. There's a, not a lot of Stellenbosch mm -hmm. Sauvignon Blancs. They're all no. about the kind of coastal yes. areas. This is quite high up on the Simonsburg, which um, I think gives it a lot of its uniqueness. And there's a lot of citrus. There's a lot it's of a lot cooler up high exactly, up there. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And there's a lot of lime elements to this, yes. which I think is going to tie in super well with yeah. your with your exactly. next with your next dish. Perfect. So that's amazing. So also have a little sip of this. I really, I mean, on the nose, this is so fruity. It really is. I cannot wait to taste it. It really, it does have a, a nice little sort of lime element. Mm. And that's kind of also why we've played around with this dish, which is very nice and, and fresh. So when we're talking about canapes as well, it's also nice to add something which is a little bit fresher. So what we've done is we do have uh, a zucchini. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a little zucchini roll up. It's almost like a little sushi roll, except we are using zucchini and we're not using um, any rice or any of the, um, the nori. So what I want you guys to do is to grab your little zucchini over here and a peeler. And very simple, if you don't have a peeler, you can use a knife, but it's obviously great to use a peeler because you'll get a nice thin little strip. And I want to pop, pop it onto the board. If you guys can see, I'm going to zoom up here. I'm just going to do a few little, basically, a few ribbons run it down smoothly all the way through so you get maybe do four or five and when you get to the middle or three quarters of the way through or so you'll have some really nice ribbons like that um, and that's what we're going to start using to do to make our roll-ups really fresh i thought this would work particularly well with the sauvignon blanc because of the fresh notes 
little bit of acidity as well. So what we'll do is we're just going to place that onto the board like that. I've done three. You guys have obviously got enough to do a few more. Um, and that's going to be the start of our little zucchini roll up. Also very similar to the last time, except this one, we're going to be using some feta cheese, very similar, but we've added a little bit of lime zest in there just to kind of give it that freshness as well. So we've got the lime zest. We've got also a little bit of our sun-dried tomato. Also gives it a little bit of acidity, exactly. nice sort of body as well. And then the last little thing is we've got a little bit of some tomato dust. All right, so this is a really quite fun little canapé. I'm going to run through this with you very slowly so you all can do it. I'll do three, um, and so you guys can just see what we're going to do. So I'm going to nip the little end off our piping bag. And what I want you guys to do is I want you to make a nice ball right in the center. Be quite generous with it. I'd say probably the size of a marble. We're going to do it like that. And I'm going to do all three. There we go, all three like that. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna start topping this a little bit with our tomato. So if you've got a big tomato like I do, just slice a little bit of a slice off it. I'd say about half a centimeter thick. There we go, can you see? I'm gonna move that to there so maybe you can see how, how wide that is. There we go. Pull that up, so pretty much like that. All right, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna place that on top of our little goat cheese. And then I'm gonna move that out and we can do the same thing over here. There we go. Um, if they're too long, just trim them off. Place that one on top. There we go. So we've got a nice sort of color contrast there as well with the green, the white, and the red. All right. So everybody caught up. You've got your, oops, I'm gonna show you over there. On top, you've got your courgette. You've got a little bit of the whipped feta with some lime, and you've got your tomato on top of that. So quite Mediterranean. Yeah, very. All right. So also very pretty. Very pretty. Nice to have colors of contrast as well. And there we go. And then what, we'll, what I want you guys to do is we're going to start rolling these up into like a little roll. It doesn't need to stand up straight. If you want to make it stand up straight, you can. Or you can just do, you can roll them just like I am, like that. Do like a little roll and keep rolling. And then we'll do the other one and we'll roll it up in your hands. Keep rolling it. There we go. And then the last one also, let's just roll it up. And what we'll do is we'll place it onto our board. Okay. So we've got three little beautiful little rolls like that. If you can see them on the board. There we go. Little courgette ribbon and a little bit of goat cheese and a little bit of the sun-dried tomato. Now, the last little thing what we're gonna do is you'll see inside, of, you've got a little bag like this, and that is some tomato dust. Very, very simple is we've taken our sun-dried tomatoes, we've placed them into the oven at about, I'd say about 100 degrees, and you just dry out those tomatoes, and then you put them into a blender and you blitz them up. But just to give you a warning, there is another little <laughs> bag inside there with another box, which is a strawberry dust. Please taste this and make sure that it is the tomato dust before you throw a little bit of strawberry over your courgette. All right. That might still work, but the dessert's going to be a bit odd. Completely. <laughs> All right. So the last little thing of this dessert, if you can bring the camera in here, I'm just going to do a light dusting on top. There we go. Of our, well, that's not even open, so that's not going to go work. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Open it up, there we go. And a light little dusting on top of the tomato dust. It's got a little bit of acidity on it. It's got a little bit of sort of umami flavors mm. as well, which will work quite well. All right, so please, as I said, take some photos. And if you do have any questions, we love answering your questions. Use the chat box inside, type us a little question and we'll be happy to answer it. But please do take photos, post them to social media, We'd love to see what you guys are doing as well. Make sure you guys are using the hashtags. All right, so I'm going to hand this over to JD. We're going to take a little sip of the Sauvignon Blanc. We've already discussed a little bit about the nose. Incredibly fruity, but on the palate, what do we get? So on the nose, there's also a herbal element. I won't mm. say it's green, but there is a, a slight kind of herbal grassiness to it. I pick up a little bit of nettle. So yes. kind of walking outside and... Uh, um, in the forest you get a little bit of a 
herbal element to it. It's not mm. a, a grassy Sauvignon Blanc. It doesn't have that asparagus character. Yeah. There's more fruit of it, but there's a kind of herbal grass element to that. And I think that's going to really tie into the tomato mm. and the courgette very nicely. Um, the palate is quite rich. Uh, it's got a lovely texture. Yes. There's acidity. And, uh, and I think that's going to work really well with your dish here. And I'm very interested to see how that little bit of lime yeah. zest that you've added into, um, into the feta, how that's going to lift. And what to me is also quite cool is, I mean, we've discussed a lot of flavors in the rosé and here. Yes. But there's nowhere where there's only lime or there's only tomato oh, or really? there's only this. So yes. it's not a case of, oh, I smell peach or apricot or whatever the case may be in this wine and therefore yeah. I must match it with that element mm. you use it in a in a kind of complementary as aspect but yes. it doesn't it's not your main your your main uh, component yeah absolutely. so yeah, yeah thanks. this looks this is beautiful yeah so take a sip guys at home take a nice sip of the of the Sauvignon Blanc roll that around your mouth and pop your little canapé in you'll find that there's a lovely sort of texture mm. and crunch that you'll get from the zucchini the lime mm. The line pops through. It really Beautiful. does pop through. And take another sip and see how that wine has changed from oh, the first. Makes the wine sip. super, super limey, obviously. It brings mm. out the it brings out that element of the wine completely. Yeah. But then also you've got a, the the earthy element of the umami of the yeah. tomato dust that you've got at the end adds a nice saltiness to it. Yeah. It brings out a different level of, or layer of flavor. And that to me is the great thing about it, is ultimately. You can change wine completely by yes. the food that you're serving with. And that's what's so interesting. So <laughs> that's what it's all about experimenting. So get some food. It doesn't matter if it's exactly this or if not. We'd love to share these recipes with you. So if you do want us, just let us know. And we'll share the recipe with you at home. But if you want to try something else, buy a flight of Warwick wine and try it at home. Try yeah. it with different things. We've explained a little bit more about the flavors. See what works for you. And that's what it really is all about. It's exactly. all about experimenting. And having fun. Mm. Invite some friends. Uh, maybe not experiment completely for the first time <laughs> with your friends. But maybe if you're daring, do that. Exactly. But, um, but yeah, that is ultimately you can change the, 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 the kind of basics of the wine completely. Yes, exactly. Yeah, super cool. And what's interesting about this as well is that there, it isn't a very, very sharp Sauvignon Blanc either. It exactly. doesn't kind of like grab you in the back of your, your throat. It's something we work on in the mm -hmm. vineyard specifically to get the acidities to a mellow kind of level as, and to not have them too astringent and too yes. um, angular. It's and, a very rounded Sauvignon Blanc. And to work, because that's a lot of, Sauvignon gets a lot of criticism, mm -hmm. especially from people like Chardonnay or Shannon's or something yes. that has a little bit more weight for the fact that it, it's too acidic and you can only have one glass and then you have a red meal and there are lots yeah. of jokes about Sauvignon. Yeah. But it, it, um, it's, it's also a variety that I think is part of its own, um, a victim of its own success. Sure. Because it's popular, people plant it everywhere. Okay. Um, and it might be planted in a site where it's actually too warm and, and you can't get it ripe. So they pick it too early, Do blah, blah, need, blah. You need quite a cool climate you need, for Sauvignon. You need, a, you need some cooling elements. So either the ocean or continental, you need height to about sea level, sure. which is what makes this one unique. Um, but yeah, it is. Otherwise, you, you don't get the... the the acidity so you lose acidity quite quickly so okay. then you have to pick earlier but then you don't have ripe fruit similar okay. to harvesting a green tomato it's sure. going to be more acidic, acidic. Yes. and and less flavorful yes um and less sweet etc so so it's all about finding a balance of of, of where it grows is it yes. in a happy space etc and i think this is these vineyards are happy and then also i think there's there's some science behind anything that has a pretty view in my opinion <laughs> yes. should make um, should make good wine yeah um so these vineyards are quite high up on the simonsburg and they look out directly at at table mountain beautiful so, um, so they must be like i said they must be happy and therefore <laughs> they must make good wine that's good. So, I mean, obviously you have a, an amazing wine estate and Dan did mention that they got some rolling lawns and you've got a restaurant out there. Is that correct? Exactly. So we've got, um, we've got a great setup for um, a very relaxed picnic focus during summer. Lovely. Obviously Cape Town weather, uh, winters, we, weather mm -hmm. doesn't play along. So we don't do the picnic offerings in yeah. winter. Then we have a, a la carte menu. Um, we're very famous for the picnics um, mm -hmm. and it's a very much a family driven set up there's kids run around there's there's a great setup you can bring your dog um we're pet friendly you can bring your cats as well if you <laughs> that way inclined it's um it really is a relaxing atmosphere and it's very much the we don't try and turn a table yeah you you, you get a spot on the lawn amazing there's a pod in in the forest there's a table there's a lawn and a Lovely. blanket 
whichever one you like. And and really, the people rock up at eleven and they leave it for an afternoon. Amazing. Spend the day and hang out. Um, there's great food. And similar to this, there are lots of little elements. There's there's bread, there's cheese, there's dips, there's pâtés, um, there's great. cured meats, there's salad. So you can play around. There's lots of texture. There's lots of flavor. And um, and ultimately, they they're designed around our wines and to Perfect. to it's the best place we Good can we can share is showcase yeah. our wines. Yeah, it's our mm -hmm. kind of number one. So um, so it's a great experience. It's a great the best way in essence to Completely to agree. to um, experience Warwick's wines. And yeah, it's just really designed about having a good time and yeah i mean that's what warwick wine really is about as well it really is and i can't wait to taste the next one no, which we're you. moving on to the red I'm just and this, yeah this you way. can hear that thank you so much um very interesting as well because obviously the first wine that we were tasting was the um pinotage rosé and now we're going on to the the true pinotage exactly. um which is the pinotage um the yeah, first, first lady, first lady pinotage so as dan mentioned earlier uh, the first lady. So this wine is named after Norma Ratcliffe. Yes. She really was mm. the first lady of, of the South African wine industry. She was well ahead of her time. Yeah. She was 30, 40 years ahead of, of her Incredible. time. She, in a very male, very Afrikaans dominant industry, yes. very tiny little Canadian woman yeah. just absolutely broke down doors and walls and said, I'm going to get into your club and I'm going to show you the way of the world. Amazing. It's um, it's unreal. So she she is uh, still today. She's an absolute amazing ambassador for not only for Warwick but for the South African industry. Absolutely. And um, and she really built Warwick. Uh, mm -hmm. She built it up to to what it is today. Her son Mike then later yes. came on and, and and grew it even further. So it really is a great family story. But Norma is ultimately the, the kind of nucleus of it all and and really started it all. Yeah. And her passion mm -hmm. was winemaking. She really wanted to make wine. Yeah. And the great stories about their early days where, where Stan told her, no, we're not making wine. You don't know anything about wine making. Our business is to grow whatever we grow and then we sell that. So if you want to take the grapes, you, you're you going to just stuff it up and then yeah. we won't be able to make money. So when the loan was paid off and they were financially in the space, he said to her, listen here, let's go for it. And that was 20 years after he purchased the farm. Really? Um, so in the mid 80s, he said to, to Norma, go for it. You can now make wine in a space where if we now lose three or yeah. four uh, tons of grapes will be fine you're right and she made six <clears throat> barrels of cabernet sauvignon in um in 1984 named that wine le femme bleu which is the yeah. blue lady yes. in, in french and that's why you're still today we've got a blue lady yeah we've got the the first lady cabernet's got a blue label yes. a blue capsule and that's what she asked for she if, if you remember back um the 1980s wines all had a cream label and they yeah. had a maroon top yeah there was no, no nothing blue. was blue nothing no. was green nothing was exciting yeah. everything was very cookie cutter and she just said i want a blue one so she found she a, a pioneer completely she found a, a, a agent that was willing to uh, get somebody in europe to make her blue capsules and blue <laughs> lady was born and that was the start of warwick you know why so Beautiful. so this is um a, a, well the entire range is dedicated to her but, uh, and then Pinotage is quite unique because it's unique to South Africa. Yes, exactly. So that's also a, a great kind of character mm. in itself. But yeah, so here we've got Pinotage in the, in the rosé, very light wine, yeah. very little time on the skins. And here we've made into a fuller wine. Yeah. Full, um, there's a lot of fruit. There's great uh, berries and cherry characters. Definitely getting cherries and some fruit. There's a bit of spice, bit, yeah. spice on there as well. tobacco. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Lovely. A little bit of mocha as well, which might work as well. Amazing. So we got our last canapé, which we're going to do, and it's going to be our dessert canapé. Quite a fun little one. We have got these two little meringues. It's basically it's going to be two little meringue kisses, a little bit of chocolate ganache, a little bit of dark chocolate drizzle, and a little bit of dried strawberries as well. So open up your boxes. You'll see that we've got two piping bags. One of them has got a little white dot in it. Um, and the other one does not. And basically, <laughs> the the one that does not have a, pipe, a, a, a dot on it is the ganache. And that is what we're going to be using to sandwich our little two meringues. Very simple. You can buy these meringues at Pick and Pay. What I want you to do is take your chocolate ganache um, piping bag. And what you're going to do is you're going to pipe a very generous little dollop right into the middle and that's going to be the glue between your two little meringues while we're making our little chocolate meringue sandwich okay quite fun something quite different 
Um, I'm going to put this onto my board so you can see. And all you do is you literally sandwich them together like that, a little meringue sandwich. And then we're going to start decorating it. So we're going to start making a little bit of a few little drizzles and dips. As I said before, make sure that you do have the strawberry dust and not your tomato dust. It might be a bit of a different one, different experience to <laughs> throw a little bit of tomato on here. But on the other piping bag with the dot, this is your just a dark chocolate drizzle. So pretty much what we've done is just made a little bit of a, a light ganache. Um, it's got dark chocolate in it, and we're going to use that literally to just do a few little swirls over it. So take it off, take a nip off the, the end of your piping bag, put your uh, meringue onto the table, and then just from a height, just do a little bit of a zigzag over it. One, two, three, uh, over there. It doesn't have to be completely perfect. There we go. And that's basically a little bit of the, the chocolate drizzle. And then to finally end it off, because there is a slight sort of strawberry notes, I think, mm, in here as definitely. well. That's why we've decided to add a little bit of our strawberry dust. As I said, very, very similar to what, how we did the um, tomato dust, is we just get literally strawberries, you slice them thinly, you put them on a drying rack into the oven at about 80 degrees, you can leave them there all night, they come out completely dry, you whiz them up in a, in a little blender, and you make this beautiful little tomato dust. So just cut the end of your bag, there we go. And then very similar to the other tomato dust, a little sprinkling on top, be quite generous, there we go. And there we are. That is a little, some, a little um, meringue sandwich with some chocolate ganache, a little bit of chocolate drizzle and some strawberry dust. Please take a photo. We'd love to see. And you still also have a chance to win the 200 Rand in Smart Shopper points. to be five lucky winners who we will announce at the end of the evening. But now it's time to try the wine and try yeah. the little meringue. I Something think slightly gotta, sweeter, a little bit of a dessert yeah. at the end. I think you've got to cut that one as well. So we we'll cut this one, okay? We'll, we'll share this one. I'll cut this straight down the middle. Um, and you Sorry can for off. destroying your creations. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Perfect. So have a little sip. And as Jenny was explaining. Yeah, so you, you get a, there's a, a sweet fruit element. Yeah. There might not be a sugary element to the wine, but there's, a, there's definitely a fruit driven, a fruit forward element to it. Yes. And um, I think that's going to work quite well with all of the elements you've got in here. Mm. And also that strawberry, it's got a little bit of a tartness to it, mm. which kind of gives it a bit of a fresh note. Oh, that's delicious. And you don't have too much sugar. Mm. So you've got sugar, you've got brightness, you've got yes. fruit, but ultimately um, it works quite well, picks up a nice kind of mocha um, caramel uh, element in the wine. It's a soft wine, this, isn't it? It's mm. really... There's, the tannins are quite low. Exactly. So the, all of the first lady wines we we design, in essence, is not the right word. Would we mm. make them to be friendly? If you come home on a Thursday night mm. and you don't have a, a a great kit of ingredients to cook yeah. with, you're going to make something simple for dinner, or you just want to have a glass of wine. These are the type of wines that they'll accompany you through. Whether it was yeah. a hard day, exactly. um, an easy day, you want to cook something. Ultimately, this is this is a partner that you put in your in yeah. your kitchen or in your lounge or wherever, and um, and that's very much lifestyle orientated. And that's why we try and make them. We want to taste. They must taste real. Mm. They mustn't taste like nothing. They must taste like wine and proper wine. Yes. But ultimately, we want them to be accessible. We want them to be drinkable. And drink, drink all the time. It doesn't have to be a special occasion. It's, it's really exactly. it's about drinking it. Like and on, on and then if you want to stick the cork back in and, and, and leave that until tomorrow night, I don't know what that's like, but um, some other people apparently do that. <laughs> um, that's, that's also fine. And, and, and really these wines are, that's the whole concept about the First Lady Range is, is yeah. to, to be a partner in your, in your home. And then ultimately we can share Warwick as an experience to only so many people. But the wine is the one thing that you can take home with you and Absolutely. you can have again and again uh, in your home. And that to me is the, the great thing about it. Yeah, completely. And I think that really is what Warwick stands for. And that's also, you know, it is really just that really great drinking wine that's so enjoyable. And obviously you have your ranges, which you, if you want to sort of move into something slightly more um, sort of delicate and, and more refined, you exactly. do have the ranges as well. There's, a, there's a, quite a few um, other products you can trade up. There's some really interesting wines. There's some very niche products. 
there's small production. So we, we really try and, and it gives us quite a nice kind of creative oh. output, um, to work with. And we make a few wines and some of them are only available to the wine, our wine club. Some of them are only available at the tasting room. So it's also a nice incentive Absolutely. to come and visit. Yeah, but also an incentive for you guys to go to pick and pay is that in your box, you will see that you have got a voucher for 100 Rand off, um, which you can use um, online, which is a really great one. And also you get 25% of all of these three wines as well. So that's an incentive to go down to pick and pay and grab these amazing wines from Warwick, as well as any other wines from the pick and pay online, where you get a 100 Rand voucher off. Um, so thank you guys. I hope that you have enjoyed it. I've really, really enjoyed myself. I love Warwick wines already, but now this has sort of opened up a whole new thing. I think that that Sauvignon Blanc is absolutely incredible. The nose in that is amazing. Um, the, for me, obviously, the rosé, one of my favorite um, out of all rosés. And it's been very, very interesting. And I really enjoyed this, um, this First Lady Pinotage as yeah, well. Thank you. Um, a great, again, great to, to share our wines. And thanks to Pick and Pay. They've done a huge amount of effort to support the, the local industry through the last three years. And uh, to Warwick specifically, always been, been very good to us. And, and yeah, great to ch chat food and wine and experience. And, and I hope you guys at home had a good time. And um, yeah, drink some more Warwick wine and exactly. come and visit. Exactly. Hopefully we will see you again for, for another one. So thank you very much. I hope you really did enjoy it. Thank you from myself, Jonathan Molden, um, and Pick and Pay. And thank you, JD. It's That's been awesome. a fantastic experience. Thank you. And hopefully we'll see you at the next one. All right. Over to you, Dan. Thank you very much. Uh, there we go. A big thank you to Jonathan and a big thank you to JD. And I, I know everybody's uh, quiet and down, but uh, a big virtual round of applause to our winemaker and to our chef uh, who put together a really great evening. I think there were so many elements there, uh, able to try a rosé and a regular pinotage from the same grape and yet tasting so different uh, and pairing differently uh, with, uh, with the different foods and, and, and bringing out such wonderful flavours you heard there. Uh, both JD and Jonathan talking about how the different wines affect the different foods. Uh, so too does wine uh, at a later stage. Now, I know not always is there leftover wine, uh, but for those of you who haven't finished a particular bottle this evening, try it in a day or two and see how the wine opens up, see how it changes. And it's just one of the many delights of wine. Uh, just having a look around, um, I'm not sure if this is a, uh, it sounds like it could be the name of one of Elon Musk's kids, uh, 1-N-H-A-F-Y. Uh, I don't know what that represents, but you guys around your table look like having a great night out. Uh, I can actually see your address. I'll be around to visit you uh, just afterwards. Looks like a great party. Uh, I can see uh, Chepo Mokolo is having a fantastic time. Uh, good to see. And I think I've got to see some smiles uh, over at the Shores, are they, are they still, there we go, uh, Sigrid Shaw, uh, because Sigrid, congratulations, you're one of our winners of our 200 Rand pick and pay voucher, and uh, there might be somebody with you who's a winner as well, otherwise it's a coincidence, is that Jonathan Shaw beside you? Uh, big thumbs up. There we go. Uh, I can't see very well. It looks like a father-daughter combination. Uh, congratulations, guys. You've each won a 200 Rand voucher in Pick and Pay Smart Chopper Points. Also, well done to uh, Lucas Van Eck, to Cindy Van Lochrenberg, and to Danira Varma. You've all won 200 Rand worth of Smart Chopper Points uh, for when you are next down and shopping or shopping online. And when you do that, as mentioned again by Jonathan, uh, there's your voucher. It will have been in your box that's 100 rand off your next wine shop. Uh, sadly, you can't color photocopy it and use multiple of them. Uh, my friend tried it. Unfortunately, it doesn't work, but it certainly does for the first one. So make use of that. Uh, and then also a reminder, there are so many good deals in the Pick and Pay Wine Club. Uh, this gives you a deal on the Chocoholic Pinotage. Uh, and that picked up 17 points out of 20 in one of the top UK wine magazines at the end of last year. So it is certainly one worth trying. Uh, before we say goodbye, 
If you look in the chat box, uh, you'll see there is a survey. There's a link there. It'll take you two minutes to complete. Uh, so two solid mouthfuls of wine uh, while you run through it. It just allows us to understand what went well, what could we improve upon, what would you like to see more of? Uh, three virtual winemakers tables a day, perhaps, but send through what you've thought. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And it just helps us to give you a slightly better experience. Uh, and that leads me to thank uh, John and the team at Source Food who do a quite wonderful job. Uh, JD, who's not just a very gifted winemaker, but as you can see, very passionate about what he does. Uh, and Tom Orpin, uh, his PA, who did a lot of work uh, this evening. Uh, and Ricardo and the team at Pick and Pay, Pick and Pay Online and the Pick and Pay Wine Club. All the food you've had today, you can find everything at Pick and Pay. You now know how to very simply make some extremely cool dishes to absolutely dazzle your next selection of guests. And you've got exactly the wine to wash that food down with. Uh, so that leaves us uh, for now. Uh, coming up uh, next month, I think it is, uh, let me get my date right. I think it is the, uh, the 17th of June, if I'm not mistaken, is the next winemaker's table. That is with Villa Fonte. It's a Friday. It is seriously old dirt, and it's your chance to hang out with one of the coolest luxury wine labels in South Africa and try some food to match. Until then, enjoy the rest of your wine, enjoy the rest of the evening. And from Pick and Pay, thank you, because we are looking to move 25 million bottles of South African wine out of wine farms onto shelves and into homes like yours by supporting South African wine. And our incredible winemakers like JD and like Warwick were able to give the industry so much support. So enjoy the rest of that wine. Enjoy the company I can see you're all keeping. Enjoy your food. We'll see you back at the next one. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dan Nichol from Dan Really Likes Wine. Goodbye. <laughs>